speaker. Her name is. Ru Thank you, Ryan, for starting the recording. Um, maybe let me redo my welcome then as well. Uh, welcome back to this session. Uh, we're now going to get started with introductions to programming led by Renee Spiewak. Uh, Renee is already online, so I'll um, give over to her to introduce herself and also to take you through the material she's got prepared for you. Cheers. All right, uh, can you hear me? We can hear you well, hi. Awesome. Um, I'll just go ahead and share my screen then. And figure out where my Zoom window has gone. Okay. Uh, so yes, I am Renee Spiak. I'm a postdoc, uh, postdoctoral researcher at the University of Manchester, and I'll just be giving you a brief introduction to scientific programming. Um, I like to give some disclaimers for my uh, lectures and presentations that what the goal of this uh, activity is. Um, I'm not trying to turn everyone into experts in scientific programming or sysadmins. Um, the goal of this is really just to level the playing field for this workshop, make sure everyone gets the most out of it that they can. And another disclaimer that is not on here, but if you have not succeeded in getting the virtual machine up and running yet, you should still be able to follow along this lecture and um, run some of these commands on your host machine if you can open up a terminal window there. But I cannot guarantee that everything will work as it should. Um, if you're in the virtual machine, just open up a terminal, you'll be able to follow along um, there. And hopefully you've also downloaded the exercises and can open up the uh, Jupyter notebook that is included in there when we get to that, so. Okay, so I'll just be going through some basic tips and tricks, basic commands for Unix, a little bit of shell scripting and um, a command called awk. And then we'll shift gears and talk about when not to use shell scripting and when Python um, a much more sophisticated programming or scripting language is going to be useful. And then I'll give you a bit about um, Python structures, types, syntax, really just going over um, all of the basics so that when you get to your exercises on actual pulsar timing later this week, you won't be struggling to figure out how to actually run the Python steps in there. All right, so as I said, I uh, have a terminal open to try out the commands and concepts as we go. So just briefly, um, kind of an introduction to the shell terminal. Uh, you can think of it as one step higher than machine language. So at the very base, you have bits, uh, ones and zeros, then you have the machine language, then you have the shell. Um, and caveat to all of this, I am not a sysadmin myself. I am a researcher, so I only know as much about uh, the shell as I need to know for research. And uh, kind of the overview of shell, um, sorry, shell commands are typically fairly efficient, but have limited capabilities. There are lots of native built-in commands that you can run to do many things, just not a whole lot of science. Uh, there are several flavors. I'm not really going to talk about this at all. Every um, Everyone who is on the virtual machine should be running bash. That is the shell that I am also the most familiar with. So that's helpful for me. Uh, if you're on your native uh, local machine, you may be running something like TCSH or ZSH. Um, so first task, uh, whenever you see these purple boxes on my slides, they will be commands that you can run in the terminal and they will always be preceded by a tilde and a dollar sign. That's my shorthand for the command prompt, the terminal prompt. You may see something different on your terminal, like uh, your username and uh, laptop name on the virtual machine. This is something like Pulsar VM at MK virtual box, something like that. Um, the prompt may also include the path where you are, but it will always, unless you have changed something, end in the dollar sign. 
and then the command or the terminal will prompt you to enter any text. So if you type into the terminal echo dollar sign shell in all caps, it should print out what shell you are running, uh, literally the uh, path to that. These other commands that I've listed here should basically do the same as well. All right. If you have any trouble with any of the commands that you are running here, please put a message into the Slack channel. I cannot see it while I'm running this and have my uh, screen shared, but hopefully other people will be monitoring that and can answer questions as we go. Um, if you have major questions, they can, uh, one of the moderators can speak up and ask in this Zoom. So looking a little bit more at what is going on with the shell, um, especially when you want to run more complicated commands. So you have a standard input to the shell, standard output, and standard error. The input in most uh, cases is going to be the keyboard. The output and the errors are going to be printed to the terminal window. And you can redirect all of these with pipes, which is the vertical bar, uh, and then greater than signs. And technically, you can also redirect with the less than sign, but that is very rarely used. If you are redirecting standard error, that must be done explicitly, but redirecting standard out can just be done with this greater than sign. So I have a bunch of examples here. I'm not going to run through all of them, but just highlight a few. So echo is a command that is built in and it just prints, prints whatever statement you tell it to. So if you echo hello world with or without the quotation marks, it should just print hello world right beneath that line. And of course you can redirect what is being printed to the terminal to a text file using the greater than sign uh, echo message in a bottle, greater than sign bottle.txt. Cat is another command which is uh, fairly useful. It prints the contents of a file to the terminal window. So if you cat bottle.txt after running echo, uh, the echo command in the previous line, it should print message in the bottle to the terminal. You can redirect from one command to another using the pipe in the next and the fourth line here, cat bottle.txt pipe wc minus c. wc is a command that uh, counts characters or lines um, or other things in a file typically, but can be uh, given input from another command. So wc minus c in this case would count the number of characters in message in a bottle. Um, and if we skip ahead to the uh, sixth line, cat when run on a file that does not exist, prints a standard error. And so you can redirect that using the two dollar sign or two greater than sign um, syntax into some file. All right, hopefully no problems were encountered with that. So let's move on to ls, another very useful command, which we'll probably be using quite a lot during this workshop. Uh, ls is a command just to list the contents of a directory. So if you are in a directory that contained a few directories and a few files, just typing ls with no other flags, no information, would print the names of everything in that directory. Um, but you can be a bit more specific, give the shell a bit of information about what kind of files to be looking for using wildcards and pattern matching. Now wildcards are, again, built into the shell. They're fairly simple, nothing too fancy here. Um, an asterisk is a greedy character, it matches as many characters as possible or none. Question mark matches exactly one, not none. And then you can use square brackets to tell it exactly what characters you want or a range of characters to match. So for example, ls star.txt would find every file in that directory matching or ending in .txt. And I'm not going to run through the rest of these examples here. Try them out on your own um, with whatever is actually in your directories. See if you can make all of this work. 
And then moving to a little bit of a similar topic, um, if you want to find text in a file, searching for a specific pattern, grep is basically the most useful tool in your toolbox. Um, it uses something similar to the wildcards and pattern matching that I explained in the previous slide, but it's um, more formal kind of regular expressions. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about regular expressions because they are fairly complicated, um, but I have links at the end or URLs at the end of this uh, set of slides that you can go and look at later, hopefully if you're actually given these slides. Um, if you're not, I can put the links into the Slack page or Slack channel. So with grip, you can search a file that, for example, has three lines with test, test two, and not. If you just search with regular grep on the word test, you would find the first two lines. You can uh, do the opposite of that, searching for lines that do not match the pattern using grep minus V. And so that would return the last line. And again, these regular expressions are not exactly the same as the wildcards. So searching for any one character, you would have to use the dot, the period uh, symbol. And using the question mark wildcard does not work in this case. Um, well, question mark does exist in regular expressions. It just means something slightly different. All right. A few more tricks uh, for figuring out or finding commands that you've run previously. The history command is very useful. Um, and I actually was supposed to mention this a lot earlier, but all of these built-in commands you can run, um, you can find more information directly in the terminal by using man command. So you do something like man echo, and that would give you um, built-in help page, manual page for the echo command. So typing man and then whatever command name you want to get more information on. I highly recommend doing this for things like grep because there's a lot of different flags that can run there. Um, but the internet is also very helpful there. So going back to history, uh, you can search the history for uh, commands that you've recently run. Again, using the pipe to uh, redirect the output into something like grep. You can search for a pattern there. The exclamation point symbol can also be used to recall a recent command, just typing the first few characters of it, as in, in this example here. And the up and down arrow keys can be used just to scroll if you only have a few lines to scroll back. So when you're actually running all these commands, the shell has to figure out exactly what command you're trying to run. What does cat mean to the terminal? So what it does is it searches a, uh, a variable called the path for matches for that command name. So this is an example of what the path, that variable, what string it may contain. Uh, this is from my own laptop, so if you do this on the virtual machine, it will look very different. Uh, the colons in this line just separate the directories paths that the uh, shell is looking at, and it goes from the first all the way to the last, and it stops when it finds match. So if it finds it in the first uh, path, then it doesn't search the rest. All right, and then... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Renee. I just wanted to interrupt you to remind the students that they can, I mean, it will be hard to run all the commands you're going through, but they can test some of them uh, on the virtual machine as they go along. So if you type something like which cat on the command line that lives in the terminal within your virtual machine, um, you should see uh, this common result come up. Or you can just test any of the other ones she's showing. Uh, as she goes through the commands. Yes, I highly recommend testing all of these as we go and mentioning if you find any, uh, encounter any errors. In theory, all of these commands should run perfectly fine on the virtual machine. I may have made a few typos in some places, but hopefully it's all good. 
All right. So what was I talking about with those that shelled variable uh, previously? Uh, it's basically a way to save keystrokes, which is very important to programmers. Um, it's a way to save some characters to be recalled later. Uh, so the shell is told these characters are assigned to this variable. And then when you call that variable later using the dollar sign, it knows what you mean. So some common ones that are built in are like dollars shell, which we used on the very first slide, dollars home, or the, simply abbreviated to the tilde, is the path that is your home directory. Uh, dollars user tells you your username, and we just mentioned dollars path. So you can set a variable. Um, this is all bash specific. So if you're using TCSH or something else on your host machine, uh, this may not work. If you do something like echo dollar shell, again, we already saw that, you can assign a variable uh, just using the equal sign, no spaces on either side. So doing something like var1 equals very long file name here.txt would set that variable so that later um, in the next command, echo dollars var1, it would print that text, um, that file name to the terminal. And you could also use commands like wc minus l to cut the number of lines in that file and so on. Uh, note in this line, the use of the semicolons to separate multiple commands um, and execute them in just one after another in that same line. Um, it's just shorthand. You could easily uh, break those up into multiple lines. I just do this usually to save space, especially in a presentation. Um, if you use the export command, the shell will save that information and not just forget about it. Um, I don't know exactly how long it takes the shell to forget about a variable which isn't exported, but if you want to make sure that the shell remembers it, use export. So if you export name equals j1713 plus 0747, then you can use that in later lines, such as uh, calling the Pulsar catalog using PSR cat command. Uh, another common um, gotcha in bash, at least, is the use of brackets in around file names, or sorry, around variable names. So if you do something, if you have a variable called name and you use skip ahead to the second to last line and echo dollars name underscore info.txt without brackets, the shell will try to find a variable called name underscore info. And that doesn't exist. So what it would print is dot txt. Using the brackets around name, as in the very last line, it will understand that that is the variable name that is following the dollars and it will print j1713 plus 0747 underscore info.txt. So just something to keep an eye out for as you're uh, working with in the shell. Um, I'll also add that the shell does recognize that dots period symbol is not um, part of the variable name, that is not allowed in a variable name. So it does break at that point and not try to include that but underscores are perfectly fine in variable names. Uh, another thing you can use um, in the shell to kind of save keystrokes is aliases. Um, often these are used when you have commands that are very frequently used or specific flags that you don't want to forget about. Uh, this example here is, um, or sorry, the first example here in this perf box is one that I often use. Um, the diff command is uh, a command which compares two files or two given inputs and tells you what the differences are. So you can set an alias for this command, including any common uh, flags that you'd like to include. So in the second line, alias diffy equals, again, the same kind of syntax as with setting variable names but this time you're actually giving it a command, not just a string, a file name or something. 
So diff E equals diff minus Y dash dash suppress common lines dash W. And then when you run diff E on those two files, it will do exactly the same as the very first line in this box. So it understands all of the flags just automatically. Uh, you can also do this for things that you commonly mistype. Um, I have a friend who does that all the time. And uh, kind of one that is recommended is an alias for rm. rm is a command that removes, deletes files or directories on your, um, in where you tell it to. And if you want to avoid accidentally deleting all of your work, rm-i is a command that uh, the dash i flag will interactively ask you if you are sure that you want to delete this. And so that will help you avoid some potential problems there. All right, uh, just briefly about file permissions. If you're working on a server with many users, you may run into some problems if you are trying to access someone else's work. Uh, even if the person tells you that you can read and write to that file, you may not actually have permissions on the machine to write to it. So these are um, kind of, yeah, usually set by the uh, owner of the file themselves uh, and anyone else with write permissions, really. And they're separated into read, write, and execute permissions. So, and the different groups that the files that the server understands are read, write, or execute permissions are users, groups, and all other users on the server. So if you're using a command like chmod um, to edit permissions, you will only be able to edit it for yourself, the group that you are in, or all other users. Uh, setfacl is another command that gives you a little bit more flexibility. You can specify a user or group by name. I give a few examples here. Hopefully they're all kind of understandable to people as they run through them. I'm not going to walk through them myself right now. A few more handy commands. I already mentioned command. Um, very, very useful for getting native uh, info on native commands. Um, if you want to edit a file directly in the terminal, nano is um, kind of the go-to on the virtual box. It's fairly easy to use. It tells you right in the bottom of the page how to exit. Um, Vim VI, I think, might also be an option on the virtual machine. Um, I know Emacs, which is another text editor, is not on the virtual machine. If you want to find and replace, uh, do some text matching. Um, something that is kind of similar to grep uh, in some ways, but it can actually replace text is said. I'm not going to talk much about this. It's a very, it's a very useful tool, but there's a lot to it. So uh, I leave that for further reading. And then here are some uh, other examples of basic commands. Head and tail can be used to look at the first or last lines of a file. Uh, if you want to get a snapshot, view of what's in a file, that might be a useful thing. RM, I already mentioned, is to delete something. You make a new directory using the mkdir, or mkdir command. You can move things from one name to another or copy them from one name to a new one. Um, just be careful if you are copying or moving directories. You may have some gotchas here. Uh, cd is the command to change directories, and cd dash will change you back to the last directory you were in. Very useful if you're bouncing between two directories working. Uh, pwd is literally print working directory, prints the path where you are, and I already mentioned wc. So a little bit about uh, shell scripting. Again, this is um, specific to bash. There are a couple of things that are very useful to do directly in the shell, especially if you're just running the commands that are native to the shell and don't need to do any fancy uh, calculations. Uh,
So for example, if you want to loop through multiple files that are in the directory, check if they contain a specific pattern and print the output to another file, you can do that using uh, this example here. I'll just walk through the different lines. Uh, the first line, so this box would be printed into a file and then would be run separately in the terminal. Uh, and I actually don't have an example about how to run such a file. That's an oversight. Uh, if someone would like to comment in this uh, Slack channel about how to run a file that contains this kind of content, please do. Uh, so the first line is a shebang. I don't know why it's called that. Um, it points to the shell that you are using for this script. Uh, so this could alternatively be slash bin slash tcsh, but this is bash. Uh, you enter a for loop just using for, assign a variable name to represent the uh, variable that you are looping over. So this variable name, the contents of this variable will change whichever, with every loop. In, what are you looping over? And then, in this case, a set of files in that path, which end in .par. Um, par files are very commonly used in pulsar timing. They contain information about pulsars and various parameters. And whenever you are starting a for loop, you have to follow it with the do statement. It tells the shell, now you are entering this for loop. Um, and I'll skip to the end and show you that the done statement is used to end the for loop. So everything in the middle between do and done is inside the loop. So for every loop of this, um, loop over these files, you're going to run this statement, uh, grep or binary in that variable, which is defined in for every loop. And these tick marks assign the um, output of a command that is run in the center to some variable, or can be assigned to some variable, which in this case is called check. So the output of grep for this pattern, binary, is assigned to check. The next statement, um, just an example of an if condition. So if, and then square brackets to actually define the condition. So if this variable called check does not or is not empty. So the dash Z here checks if it is empty. If it is not empty, not being the exclamation point, then you do what's in the set, in a, inside this if statement. So you would echo the file name, which is again defined for every loop, and the word binary into a file called binaries.txt. Um, and kind of the same as with the for loop, if statements start with if then, and end in fi, which is literally if backwards. Uh, you can also have else or elif, E-L-I-F statements inside here, um, but this is just a very simple example. So literally all that this script does is it loops through files, checks if a very specific pattern exists in that file, and if it does, prints the file name and the pattern binary to a different file. Hopefully that all makes sense. Um, I'll just add a few more gotchas. Uh, Bash is very particular about white space and brackets, so there can be some issues there. Double square brackets for the if conditions with spaces on either side should, in theory, always work. So I already mentioned um, the ticks in this uh, line, just returning the standard output of the command to a variable. Uh, another common use for this syntax is to loop over the contents of a file. So if you're looping over just the file names in a directory, 
you can use the star.txt or star.par syntax. But if you want to loop over the contents of a file, you need to extract it first using something like cat and assign that to the variable name using the ticks in this um, example here. All right. Um, just as an aside, the awk command is extremely useful. It's basically an entire scripting language in and of itself, very versatile. Um, it can be used to look at the contents of a file, divide it into rows and fields, which are columns, and variables can be used to access all of those um, values. The uh, Default field separator, column separator, is just white space, uh, but can be changed to, for example, a comma if you have a CSV file. And that earlier example where, you were, where we were looking to see if a specific pattern existed in a file can be rewritten completely without that uh, complicated check equals grep and the if statement by using awk. So in this command, awk does all of the check and grepping um, just in a single line. So as awk is working through each file name, which is defined for each loop, it looks at whether the very first line in, sorry, the very first field, the very first um, value in a line in a row is equal to binary. And if it is, then it prints the file name and the last value in the row, so the number of fields, the value, into a different uh, file called binaries.txt. And again, this example does not tell you exactly, uh, <laughs> it's not a very good indicator of what AUK can do, how versatile it is. It's just a basic example. So please do. Uh, do some further reading on awk. I have, again, a URL at the um, end of this presentation. And ask commands if you, or ask questions if you run into any issues with this or have um, any confusion. All right, so if you are running through a, um, or going through a file and trying to understand more about the contents of that file. For example, if you have a CSV file of pulsar names and various information like the period of the pulsar, the dispersion measure value and other parameters. Um, if you haven't, if you don't know what dispersion measure is, I'm pretty sure you will by the end of today. Um, you can do something like this with awk just by using again a condition with an if statement to check in this case, if the very first value of this uh, row is equal to J0125 minus 2327. And in that case, if it satisfies that condition, it would print yes. Notice the brackets here are around the if statement, and then there's a separate print statement here. So no matter what the result of the if statement is, it will also print the first value of the row, the second value multiplied by one by 10 to the three, and the third value. It doesn't matter how many values are in this row, as long as there are three, this will work. So for the first few lines of this file, it just prints those three values. And again, well, you can't really see it here because I don't tell you what this, uh, original file is, because this is just a made-up example, but this second value is multiplied by a factor of a thousand. When it reaches the third line, sorry, fourth line uh, in this file, and finds that the very first value is equal to J0125 minus 23.27, you'll notice that it first prints yes, and then prints the line. So if these two statements wrapped in brackets were reversed, it would do the opposite. It would first print all three. I think it would first print all three and then do that. I want someone to try that and see if it actually works. Um, again, make it up your own example. Hopefully you can uh, follow something like this and get it to work.
All right. So I'll also point out that in this case, I use this dash F flag to change the file separator. So instead of white space in this file, uh, if I just print the first line of this file, also I set CSV, which is again, a made up example, each row, sorry, each column is separated by a comma. There's no white space in here. So if you ran this without the dash F flag, it wouldn't work. Well, it would print something, I think, but it just wouldn't make any sense. So using the dash F flag with the comma avoids these issues. Uh, with Depending on the separator, you may have to surround it with single quotes. Um, and again, notice that, sorry, I didn't point this out earlier, but I noticed that the stuff that awk is actually running is all surrounded by single quotes as well. So any of these statements inside brackets, they have to be surrounded by single quotes. Okay. So in that previous example, we did a tiny bit of arithmetic and that was basically the only maths that we did in this whole lecture because doing arithmetic in the shell is not really straightforward. The shell, at least bash, considers every variable be, to be a string. It doesn't try to understand what the uh, value of that string is. It just can read and print it. So in order to do any kind of arithmetic, you have to first tell the shell to treat the variable like a number. Uh, sounds like some of to continue. So one way to do this, uh, to tell the shell to treat a variable like a, uh, an actual number, is to use double parentheses. So in this case, x is given a value of 3. And if you want to add a number to it, um, you have to use the dollar sign double parentheses around x plus 3. You can also use the let command, again, to tell the shell to treat what follows as math. And so x equals 5 plus 4, it'll actually do that math and assign the value of 9 to x. Uh, the expr expression command, again, does that and prints the result. So you can use this to do basic arithmetic. I don't think it can do anything like a square root, um, but it may be able to do powers, um, exponentials. And again, you can assign the result of this to a variable uh, using this last syntax here. Um, and if you want to do anything much more complicated, there's the built-in calculator BC. So if you have a, um, well, really a string printed and then passed to the BC command, it will uh, evaluate that string as math and enter and return nine. Um, you can also specifically go into uh, the BC shell kind of thing, but I don't really work much with that, so I can't really help if you have any questions there. Um, Exponentials do work here. Um, so 5 raised to the power of 4 will result in 625. And again, if you want to assign the value of whatever math you're doing to um, a variable name, you can use the tick marks here. Uh, so echo 7 times 3 into bash, or sorry, into bc. All surrounded by tick marks would assign the value to x. If you want to use um, slightly more complicated um, functions, you can use the dash L flag on BC to tell it to use a math library that gives you access to things like sine, cosine, square root. Um, and I have more information, or have a link to more information here, um, and also listed at the end of these slides. But if you're really doing anything much more complicated than a few 
sines, cosines, and square roots. You don't want to be doing that in the shell. Um, if you want to find the median of a list, it is possible. You can do that. You sort the list and use WC minus L to count the number of lines and do some conditional maths there. But it's not a straightforward thing. Uh, and getting the standard deviation, you can probably do that as well, maybe with awk. Other statistical analyses are getting much harder though. And if you want to make nice plots, a new plot exists, but I wouldn't really call those nice. I'm biased. And if you want to handle large arrays or tables of data, then you're really going to be struggling in the shell. So that's where we want to move to something like Python. I'm going to pause here and see if anyone has any questions first about other Unix stuff. And fix it. Thanks, Renee, for the pause. Um, there is actually a question on the Slack channel asking, can we extract data from a dat file and save it as a CS file with ARC? And if yes, how? Sorry, can you repeat what the file types were? Um, so the original idea was if you start with a dat file and you wanted to make it a CSV file. Uh, so you can do that with awk if you know how many columns are in the file. But I would actually recommend using sed as ed for that. Um, I didn't talk much about it, but it is text find in one place. So in that case, you would find the white spaces and replace them with commas. Unless, of course, you have strings that could contain white space in there. And that's just confusing. You wouldn't want that. Yes. <laughs> Fatima, if you can mute, please. Thank you. Um, thanks, Renee. Yes, of course, you can also do all these types of edits within the text editors that Renee mentioned. Um, I don't see any other questions right now. I do want to alert people to Sarah Buchner suggested that we share the presentation. So we've done that on the channel. It's a Google link share. So you can also follow along there if you want to grab um, hold of particular commands that Renee is going through and, and test them out for yourself. So thanks for that suggestion. Um, so far, I don't see any other questions. Let me just scan the Zoom. Uh, you answered the man question already, so I think you're uh, good to continue. All right. So brief introduction to what Python is. Um, it's designed to be fairly easy to learn. It's uh, fairly similar to English grammar in many ways. Um, it's also fairly similar to Bash, so maybe that uh, biased me a bit. There's a lot of documentation as well on basically every aspect of Python. So that's to the good and bad, I guess, because uh, there's a lot to sort through there. It's very quick for small jobs that don't require a lot of um, IO, I guess. Uh, there's an interactive shell that you can run quick jobs as well. Um, and it's also a very mature language now with very large development team and community contributions for astronomy tools and such. So for doing scientific programming, it's a pretty good uh, option. It's also good with a variety of data types. There are uh, several tools that were developed to do this. It's not the most efficient, uh, so it's it's not compiled right to runtime. It's just a scripting language, really. Um, so if you're doing huge processes that uh, take a lot of memory, for example, Python may not be the way to go. But it is what we're going to use for most of the exercises later this week. So there are a couple of ways to actually run Python. Um, Again, I'm kind of kicking myself for forgetting to actually give you an example of how to run a shell script in the terminal. But they can, Python scripts can be run in, the same, in a similar manner. So if you have a simple script that just contains this line, print parentheses hello world, in a file called simple.py, you can run that file just using Python and the file name. Hopefully, I didn't actually try doing that myself, but hopefully that should work. Um, you can open a Python shell. 
So instead of using bash commands, you would then use Python commands uh, just by typing Python. Or you could type IPython, have a slightly, somewhat easier to use, a little bit more um, help options there. Uh, but still a shell. And if you want something that's a little bit more user friendly, Jupyter Notebook um, or Jupyter Lab is a very, very good um, way to go. And they, as it kind of implies with notebook idea, it's very useful for experimenting without losing your work when closing it. So we are actually going to be using Jupyter Notebooks uh, later as well. So more on that. And just to note that many Python scripts have kind of built-in help commands, uh, help information, which you can access using a dash h or dash dash help flag. Not every Python script is written with this option, but many of most of the good ones are. And I believe most of the ones that will be used later this week will have this option. So kind of the structures of Python um, going from big macro scale to uh, micro scale, you have packages, which are, uh, which can be written by anyone in the Python community. They are distributable. Uh, so one person can run them on their laptop and another person can run them on their supercomputer. They can essentially be compiled and then read into Python used in other scripts. They're typically not executable on their own as scripts. Uh, packages may contain, should contain, modules, which are assemblies of smaller objects for easier access. Modules technically are a Python object in themselves. Packages are not Python objects, they are assemblies, um, distributable. Classes are, um, they basically define the structure of a Python object. They give it attributes and functions and methods that can be run on those things. They are not, um, they are defined prior to being used um, and they are not automatically built into Python. Well, some are. And then there are, as I mentioned, functions. These are executable objects. They take some input, technically optional, perform some actions, technically also optional, and they return some output, which is technically also optional. You can have a function that takes no input, does no action, and returns no output. That is a legal Python function. Not very useful though. Uh, and then there are variables. These are not executable. They contain some values. Um, there are some, several built-in variable types, strings, booleans, integers, floats, lists. I'll talk about some of these more or give you examples of them in the uh, Jupyter Notebook. I note that I am slightly running out of time, so we may not go all the way through the Jupyter Notebook later or right away. And a note for people who have uh, used other programming languages, Python uses dynamic typing, uh, also known as duck typing. So you don't have to declare the type of an object before using it. You assign it to a variable and Python looks at it and says, does this look like a duck, quack like a duck? If it is, it's, if it does, it's probably a duck. Uh, that's where the phrase duck typing comes from, just so you know. It basically just checks, does this thing look like this type of variable? If it does, it's probably that type of variable. And as I mentioned, uh, Python is developed by a huge community. There are hundreds of Python packages that are freely available to use. Um, some that are highly recommended for scientific programming are NumPy, Matplotlib, SciPy, AstroPy, and Pandas. Um, if you have that package installed in your Python environment, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, then when you open up, when you're actually writing a Python script, you can import it, uh, as shown here, import numpy as np. This literally says import this package called numpy and assign it to the name np. And then later you can call variables that are contained in that package, in that 
what is now a module in Python. Um, this variable pi is contained in this module just right there. So np.pi would print the value of pi to some number of digits. Uh, print is a built-in function, so you don't have to uh, import anything in order to use that. Some of the most commonly used uh, imports, especially well, most commonly used, are import numpy as np, import matplotlib.pyplot as plt, and import pandas as pd. Highly recommend these. Um, yeah, so briefly about Python environment. Um, the environment basically tells Python, or when you are running Python, uh, you what you can access, what packages are there, how they are dependent on each other, what versions they are, etc. Sometimes you might need to use one version of a package for one script and a different version for another. Slightly uncommon, but it has been known to happen. And different scripts, depending on how they were updated most recently, may conflict with each other. And so you don't necessarily want to have just everything in one place. So Python environments can be managed using something like Anaconda, or as is the case on the virtual machine, Miniconda. They function almost exactly the same. So you can call them using just the conda command. Uh, you could do things like creating a new environment uh, using a specific type or a specific version of packages. So in this case, I just specified Python 3.6. And you can give it a name. And then you can activate that specific environment and run all of your scripts in there using those packages and not have any conflicts. Uh, one thing that you should be able to do right away on the virtual machine is do conda list. And that will tell you what packages are installed right there in the terminal. If you want to install more packages, you can simply do that using conda install and then the package name at the end. In this case, in this example here, I specify a um, channel that conda looks in. Um, this is usually optional and you can set up some things to tell conda to look specifically in channels, but usually you can just leave off this flag and value here. And again, we will be using Jupyter Notebooks, so hopefully everyone can run that. And I think, yeah. So at this point, I think we're running out of time for um, the Jupyter Notebook, but I'm just going to, hopefully this will work, show you what that might look like when you uh, open it in the uh, virtual machine. So give me a second to switch the screen share. Hopefully my screen sharing actually works this time. Okay, so my screen sharing is messed up, so I won't actually be able to show you the Jupyter Notebook inside the virtual machine. But I can show you. Eh. No, that's not going to work. Okay, if one of the other moderators would like to <laughs> pull up the Jupyter Notebook in their virtual machine just to show everyone what it should look like if it's running, because, yeah, Zoom is not working for me. And you're welcome to stop your screen share and just start it again. It will probably be easiest if you. Uh, scroll through it, uh, but in the meantime, I'll see if I can bring it up. Yeah, Zoom occasionally for me only lets me share um, from browser windows, so I can't actually select the virtual machine window right now. I don't know what's going on with it. I think I need to update it or something. But yeah, if you uh, go into your virtual machine, and navigate to wherever you have downloaded the exercises. You should see a file in the lecture three exercises that ends in IPy and IPYNB. If you run Jupyter Notebook and then that file name, 
you should be able to um, yeah you should be able to um, see Renee I've goes. brought up my screen uh, you can let me know if that's useful to you are you seeing my virtual box yes so you want me to do Jupyter Notebook and uh, this one? Yep. Cool. Let's see where it launches. So that should here. automatically open a browser page. If it doesn't, you can click on the link to get it to open. And now you, you should see something like what Marissa is seeing there. So uh, again, we are running out of time for this, so I won't run through all of this uh, myself. Hopefully you can, uh, everyone can run through it on their own, just hitting control enter or shift enter to go through all of the different cells. And if you run into any questions, please post them in the Slack channel. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Renee. Um, I hope many of you can have this Python Basics notebook up. Um, and as you can see, I'm just scrolling through it on Renee's behalf. You can see there's a lot of um, text in between to help you navigate through what all the various outputs um, mean and do. Um, and you can use uh, whenever is convenient for you during lunchtime or across other breaks to just have a look at all the um, Python command she's teaching you here. Alrighty, um, shall I just check back if we've got any other questions up on the programming channel? I'm not seeing any there. Um, can any of the other moderators let me know if we've got something on the Zoom chat? Um, I'm just looking at that now. I don't see any more recent ones. Okay, cool. So maybe just a reminder to launch this Jupyter Notebook, you would type the words Jupyter Notebook and then with a space in between and then the IPINB, the file name that ends on IPINB. Um, I just dropped my screen share, so um, I'll type that in the channel. Um, I'll, I'll put a screenshot in the channel to remind you how to launch it. Thanks, Renee. I think we'll move on to Daniel if he's um, about ready. Uh, Daniel, 